Hello and welcome to Skeindo Knits. My name is Ellie and I am a Norwegian living and knitting in London. And you can find me on Instagram as Skeindo and I am Skeindo Knits as a designer on Ravelry. And I also have the Ravelry group Skeindo Knits, which is a great place to take part in knit alongs, etc. So yeah, hi and welcome to this knitting talk show, knitting podcast, what have you, where I sit and talk about knitting for about an hour, perhaps on a monthly basis. Uh, the schedule is still a bit up in the air, so if you're new here, that's kind of what I do here. And if you are a returning viewer, welcome back. I have a lot of knitting to cover today and I have barely any time to record, but right now I do, even though I am feeling quite sleepy because I had a very busy weekend. Uh, one of the days I went to the, what was it, the Southwestern Wool Show, or Yarn Show, one of those, and came back with quite a bit. Uh, so this is going to feel like old times with the holes and everything. And I've also knitted a lot, and I've been on a yarn crawl with a friend, and I am going to go to a yarn show this weekend, if I can get this video up in time, uh, to Stitch Udama, just north of Oslo. So that's going to be fun. I'm going to give a talk on Gage in Norwegian to an actual audience that is there and not on camera, like, and, you know, the other side of the camera. You know what I mean, online. Not just talk to a camera. That's going to be something. So with whatever energy levels I have today, I'm, I am going to be recording this podcast episode and talk about this plethora, this pile, this all of this, there's so much knitting next to me here. <laughs> also, we're in the living room for change because I happen to have a place to myself today and uh, the light is pretty nice so why not you know so as ever i do start my podcast episode by talking about the knit alongs i'm running before i get into projects and the cows i'm running right now are the festive yoke cow which you just have to make any of my festive yoke cardigan or pullover and finish by this christmas and there's the skein their garment cow 2022 where you just have to make one or many of my garment patterns by the end of the year and however many garments you make is however many entries you get more on that in any other episode I've done. I kind of want to focus on this new thing I've got going because it's very exciting and it needs a little bit of a backstory because I started this whole designing thing with a humble pattern called the Sarbe Mittens, as you may remember. And the Sarbe Mittens ended up being part of the Sarbe Mitten Club and that took off more than I could have ever expected as a newbie designer or barely a designer at all. It was just something I thought would be a fun thing to do. And what a club is, is that you buy a collection, kind of like an ebook, only it's empty or will at least consist of one pattern. But as someone who's now part of this club by having purchased this ebook, you now get a new pattern every month until the club has ended and then you just have all the patterns. And that sort of became a bit of a tradition on here. I did that in 2017 for the first time and we repeated the success in 2018 and in 2019. That was the third Sarbu Mitten Club. And I really feel like the Sarbu Mitten Club peaked that year and that's sort of why I haven't done it since then and also having to focus on my PhD and finishing that in time. And so last year I kind of did a more relaxed, laid back kind of accessory club that wasn't exactly a Sarbu, but you know, sort of got a little bit inspired anyway. I can't help myself. And I've been thinking about returning to mitten clubs but I've also known in my heart of hearts that I peaked with the Cyber Mitten Club of 2019, the third one, I think is the best I could do. So this mitten club will be different, it will go beyond Sarbu, so we'll kick things off with a Sarbu-ish mitten pair and then we're gonna look beyond Sarbu, we're gonna look beyond Norway and look at the rest of Northern Europe and other places around here that I have my heritage and I'm very interested in the knitting traditions there and the sort of mitten style that they have and how they differ from Serbian mittens. So we're going to be looking into, well, several different countries. I do call it the Nordic Mitten Club, but it will be more than just the Nordic countries, rest assured. So these might be mitten styles that are totally new to you or there might be mitten styles that you have seen before but perhaps never dabbled into and this could be your very first time and if you're already familiar with the way that I do my mitten patterns you know that could be more comfortable but at the same time I have made this club with no assumptions that you have been part of any of the previous clubs so if you haven't you're still good to join this but I did have in mind also that a lot of people are probably going to want to return to mitten clubs of mine and so I've tried to change things up a bit as well so I'm not going to assume any prior knowledge but I want to put in some new and different features. I'm not going to say which ones yet. 
I've had some questions about what sort of yarns to be prepared for and generally if you have a stash of the sort of yarns that I normally use here like Loma Fienul or anything similar to that you will be good for pretty much all of the pairs. One's going to be holding it double but the rest will be holding it single as usual. The first pair however is DK Weights. That's the only one that's different and that is the one that I'm launching the club with. So without further ado... <laughs> They are going to look very sad, but they are the cyber mittens of this club. So that we have one pair that is, and then we can go and move beyond Sarbu. I'm going to miss Sarbu though, my goodness. Here we go. This is the first pair. They're already included, so if you go and join the club now, you'll get this pair. This pattern. You are not gonna, You have to make it. You have to knit them. Uh, someone has to knit them for you. <laughs> That's not part of my job. And this is the palm side, so I try to keep them sort of as straightforward as possible. Again, interesting for those of you who have done this before, because it's a very different sort of chart. I've gone and sort of... This isn't a usual kind of chart you'll find on the actual hand of the mitten. There might be a cuff chart or things like that. So I thought it was really cool to try to like flip it on its head and see if it will fit into the sort of blade of the, the mitten hand, if you will. Whereas it still has a lot of other very familiar features, such as a striped cuff, um, the striped mitten gus thumb gusset, uh, very simple palm pattern. So it, this thing I cranked out. I'm not going to admit how quickly I did this. Obviously, I do have a lot of mitten knitting experience, but I'm telling you, the chart is intuitive. It's easy to breeze through. Uh, good for beginners. And if you want to just return easily into cyber knitting again, then that's the first pair. So I used Embla by Hillesvog, which is not a yarn I can get around here anyway, so there's not, you know, a requirement to make these, just any DK weight yarn will do. I suggest obviously something that's fuzzy and has a bit of grip to it, anything wool and spawn, but again, mitten's gonna mitten, so as long as it's DK, sort of 22 stitch gauge these, but you could also make them a 24 stitch gauge. I, th I tend to throw in a few gauges so that you can make the exact same mittens, but on multiple different sizes. More on that in my talk in Oslo, well, in Harmod, technically. Um, I know you can't go there, but I talked about this a lot before. It's kind of how people manage to have these heritage design mittens in generations and be able to make them for the entire family. Just subtly changing your needle size and maybe also yarn weight, maybe not to uh, attain different sizes. And these sizes are quite universal. They'll fit most adult people. That's the cyber mittens that will be kicking off this club. And then I, ah, oh, I'm gonna talk about the next pair already, but we're gonna have to wait for next month for that. So now that it's out there, you can click the link in the description down below. I will also put a in sort of temporary discount code on here that you can use while the club is sort of happening. I'm, as I'm recording now, I haven't quite thought through how that works. I'm just gonna write that on here. So take that as, you know, the, the truth. That's the club. There's absolutely no pressure or requirement to keep up with knitting all the pairs. Of course, that's a very nice challenge to, for yourself. You wanna make this pair for this month, next pair for that month, and then keep up. Like, that is fun, but you obviously don't have to. I quite enjoy doing both. I've been a member of quite a few clubs over the years, and there have been some where I have really wanted to keep up and knit every pair for every month. And then other times I just enjoy receiving a pattern every month and I just enjoy that. I know by the time the club's over, I have that collection of patterns that I can knit in my own time. So like either way, I always enjoy them for that reason. It's just a nice way to be surprised and like kind of feel like you get a little bit of a, a present. So yeah, I don't know if there's much else to say about that. I, I have a lot of things I want to put into this club that is like a little bit extra, but I'm not going to make any promises about that. So yeah, possibility for bonuses, but you know, we'll see, we'll see. So whew, now that that's over and done with, I can finally talk about all my knitting since last time we spoke because I have, as I talked about last time I spoke, well, been on a, quite a finishing spree. I don't know what's happened to me. It just seems like that person I thought I was in 2017, 18, and 19 and so on who thought that I would finish all my knits has finally actually come into manifestation. <laughs> I've taken form. I am now that person who finishes my project instead of casting on a new one. Though I will say between some of these projects that I have finished here, I did have a near cast on experience, I will say. Um, it was it was close. I kicked up the yarn. It was ready. I got the needle size. I even got a tiny project back out. I had the pattern sort of not printed up, but I'd taken a photo of it from the book and I was like ready. And then I thought, I don't I don't know if I want this. No, when I nailed this thing, I got going. I was like, who is she? 
So I didn't cast on, actually. But let's talk about the things I finished. One thing I never thought I would finish is the Magnolia socks. Does anyone remember the Magnolia socks? Has anyone been around for that long? How long does it take for one skeinder to knit a pair of socks? I cast on these beauties in April 2018. That is over four years ago. It's nearly four and a half years ago. These were the second pair in the, uh, the second pattern, if you will, in Helen Stewart, aka Curious Handmaid's first sock club. So again, there you have me. I really uh, enjoyed like knitting each pair as they came out because I knitted the, whatever they were called, the socks that came out before these. I totally blanked on the name now, I've known this. Uh, and really enjoyed them and I was immediately ready to cast on the next pair and keep up with it. And then I uh, just didn't finish, we'll get to that. I did actually buy the second sock club as well and that's kind of when I find that I really enjoyed just receiving the patterns as well. Uh, it's just nice. Now I just know I have all those patterns to my disposal, I'm kind of thinking about maybe I should cast on some of those next now because now I've finally got these out of the way I'm thinking I would like more of them and it's a really nice way to use up my sock yarn that I have, the, the indie dyed stuff this is Circus Tonic Handmade this is beautiful beautiful yarn that, although I know how now Circus Tonic Handmade I believe this was given to me by someone else, who a lovely viewer of this podcast back when and I was really eager to cast them onto these socks because I just knew they would be so beautiful and delicate um, and then I sort of thought that I was the kind of person who would be more likely to finish faster if I did them two at a time. So you know two at a time is when you get a magic loop needle out and you put the socks on, both socks on the same needle um, and I just sort of split up the yarn into two little cakes. <sighs> it, nope, two at a time is not for me. I might try it again for a slightly less involved pattern but the chart here, why am I doing this? Like you're gonna see the chart. I have a PhD, I'm actually a very smart person. <laughs> I, this is quite involved. Um, there's a lot of twisted stitches in these cables. Uh, if I was gonna do this again, I'd actually do these into sort of twisted stitches like I have on the librarian instead of these cables that I don't here was quite a bit unnecessary maybe. Um, I wouldn't have needed to knit I don't know if these cables needed to be knit through the back loop the way it's in the pattern, just to kind of make it easier for myself. I, it was just quite fiddly at the time, but then when I picked this up again now, I didn't find it so fiddly anymore. Sure, it is quite a slow knit because this lovely chart that runs along the front here does pull the socks together so much so that you have to knit a lot of length to kind of make up for that. Um, so they looked kind of like just this long, very narrow, uh, yeah, so when I picked them back up again, I was sure I was close to the toe, but it did still take quite a while to get there. So I think that's kind of why two at a time socks is just not for me, because it just feels so much slower. And I'm all about slow knitting and all that stuff, as we'll see in a bit. But, yeah, it didn't motivate me, who, someone who's already not a massive sock knitter, to really get on these. Uh, so that's why it took me four and a half years, and I stand by that explanation, <laughs> or excuse, what have you. But now I'm really pleased with it. They are so elegant. They are, I'm almost afraid of wearing these, quite frankly. I think they are too beautiful to be worn. I just kind of have to encase them in glass and just like not get any dirt on them. <sighs> yeah, and uh, these are the Bryson sock blockers. I, you get them from Lupin here in London. That's all I know about them. I, the only thing I have modified is the toe. I kind of like to round off the toes a little bit more. I, felt, I found that it was a little bit square in the pattern. It might have been fine, but just in my head, I wanted to just give it a little bit more of a rounding in the end. That's pretty much it. But I did like this toe. It tapers a little bit more because it starts off with decreasing every third round for a bit and then every second round or every other round, if you will, and then every round. I just wanted to do slightly more every round. And I think that's that's it. Ready for, for the next pair. But I am still in a finishing mode, so I haven't cast on the next pair. I've thought about what yarn it should be because I still have a lot left of my trellis yarn from the Meandro socks that I designed way back. That's the beauty of when you do color work socks, it's what you have left of each contrast color. It's pretty much enough for a stock in a pair each. So like you can, if you buy two full hand dyed skeins, 100 grams each, so usually you can make three pairs of socks if one of them's color work, I find. So that's pretty cool, I might do that. Yeah, Magnolia socks by Helen Stewart. Done and done. Next we have something that I thought I would finish. Again, it must have been autumn 2018. 
and it was a quick knit. It was just a little cheeky cast on. It's iron weight. It'll be fast. I got this yarn in a sort of discount bin at Wild and Wool here in London because there you can sort of leave your stash yarn and then someone else can buy it for really cheap. And Jane, who is sort of a local knitter, she had given up on a uh, garment project of hers and just caked up the yarn, uh, gave it a soak and all that stuff. So some of it is like in these big spit spliced cakes, uh, well, the skeins that I caked up. And I knew then that I wanted to knit the jadeite cardigan by Osta Tricosa uh, from her ziggurat book, which is her ziggurat method of kind of assembly, a top down set in sleeve garment. And I'm obsessed with that method. It's so cool. I think it's wonderful. And I cast on, I think two of her garments two of the patterns from that book, I just didn't finish any of them, I was just so enamored with the methods, I just wanted to knit all of them from here down to the underarm. Oh dear. Uh, but I did actually get all the way to the sleeves as well with these, it was with this one. It was just the body that took me a while and then I decided, you know what, we're gonna finish her, we're gonna do it. And I did. And it's beautiful and charcoal, much like the uh, Granito and uh, Widow's Kiss from last week. So I don't know what the deal is with me and uh, these greys. I think I've just finally accepted that. I mostly just wear black and charcoal and things like that. With the exception of today apparently because I needed something to contrast against I suppose. Um, and yeah, maybe just... Honestly, sometimes I look at my yarn stash and I wonder who do I think I am wearing all these colours. Because I look at my drying rack right in front of me here and it's all black clothes. <laughs> I used to be a goth, I don't suppose you guys know that, but I was for a solid seven years, I think. So this is jadeite. Oh, it's so comfy. This beautifully soft, soft merino silk tweed yarn. Oh, it's so comfy. You guys don't know how comfy it is. Ignore the ends. I was actually very close to weaving them in before recording today. I, honestly, I have them all here. That's why I have the granito and widow's kiss here as well. It's just because I'm going to weave in all the ends in one go. But... It was either weaving in the ends or recording while we still have daylight, so that's why I'm wearing these with just we're tucking in the ends, so yeah. I can barely remember how I did this wedge in a contrast colour, that was a thing, in, you know, in the pattern obviously. Um, <laughs> but the, the beginning, it's just the way this whole cardigan works, honestly, the way it has you do everything in one go, so the button bands are done concurrently with the body, so I didn't have to save any yarn to the end for that. Um, then you do the pockets concordantly with the body. Yes, it has pockets. And so that's sort of like in a double knit method. So again, you can estimate your yarn all the way till the end. It's, this is wonderful. And the only ends I actually have to weave in because of spit slicing is for the end of the sleeves, for the start of the sleeves, the start of the body, the end of the body, and the start and the end of each pocket. There's just, She tries to really minimize the number of ends you weave in. For setting sleeves designs and uh, I just think that's really cool. <laughs> I like that a lot. So let's show you the pockets. Uh, I am going to sew on buttons. These, uh, regrettably, I only bought six thinking I need only six. I need seven. So if anyone has the seventh one of exactly these, I know where I can get them. I thought it was textile gardens but I haven't seen them there. So pretend these are buttons. I will button up like this. It still fits despite my size having changed on and off since, but you know, no complaints there. So hey, pockets. It's not the best finishing. I did not do the twisting the yarn so that we avoid gaps perfectly here. I really, really didn't. But I also don't care, so that's great. Here as well. It's I was like binging through Moon Knight when I was knitting this, so that's kind of what I come to associate with this cardigan with. But yeah, it's so comfy. Um Apologies, I can't get further back. There's a sofa here, so that's that, really. But jadeite is officially finished. And it's so wearable. It is so wonderful. It's so soft. I I can tell this will be a, a, a very much used and loved throw on cardigan in the times to come. I mean, it's gonna be so cold. Like, it, I don't know what the weather's gonna be. I just know that uh, we're probably not gonna be able to afford heat this winter. I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of not super personal on this podcast anymore, but we had a bit of a scare with our landladies wanting to put up rent by £300 per month. Yeah, plus uh, this whole country, the, the utilities are going up so much that people can't afford heating this winter. There are people that are a lot worse off than us, but it's just quite sad, this the state of everything. Uh, so yeah, I'm just knitting to 
cope. It's not too bad in London, just thank goodness I'm a niche, that's all I'm saying. Well, that got suddenly very depressive. Hey, Jade, I'd finish it, finish things. <laughs> I don't know what possessed me to think that I could actually finish this uh, at various shows and stuff. I remember bringing this with me a lot of places, thinking I would just sit and knit it here and there and everywhere. Uh, one, it's charcoal yarn. It's not the easiest to see in all lighting, although I do have fairly good vision, though it was better before lockdown than after. It's also a lot more involved than you think, where I thought I had a sort of plain old stockinette body left, you know, suddenly the pockets come in and everything and you just go like, okay. I've got to think very clearly and have a lot of alone time uh, sifting through this, this pattern. Um, because also to cause the patterns, I'm never gonna leave you bored. They're never gonna just be like, hey, I just didn't stock in it. Never, never, never. You, I mean, you can do that. You can just choose to do that. You know, after the underarm, the world's your oyster, you do what you want with your project. But there's just so much that's like hidden in there and there. Just... She's done, jadeite is done, pockets and all, these little sleeve wedges and everything. Just gotta weave in the ends and put on the buttons. That's why the buttons are here. That's why the cardigan's here. I'm actually intending to do it. And when I've done it, I'm gonna do photos. I'm gonna put them up on Instagram and my Ravelry projects. And yeah, stay tuned for that, I guess. There's honestly more finished projects here than what's reasonable on uh, Instagram and podcast that is more about me making my own designs and none of these are my own designs. But I think it's really important, and I've said this lots of times before, it's really important if knitting is your hobby and it also becomes a job to retain it as a hobby as well and knit things for fun. And this is a lot of knitting for fun. It's a lot of it. The next one is Aldous. Aldous, I don't know how to pronounce things ever. Um, this is a Isabel Kramer pullover that I was, okay, so I started this, and it was, uh, this must have been a 2019 cost, I think. I started it, you know, with the love of this construction method, this saddle shoulder raglan contiguous mishmash that I love to do myself as well. So seeing some other designer do that, I'm like, yes, I want to knit that, I want to, <sighs> it's just, it's a very lovely fit. And then I thought I had the perfect yarn for it. I say thought because the yarn says it has about 400 meters per skin, I think a little bit less than that, but roughly. That should have been enough for this pullover. Could have just had a slightly shorter body maybe, and it you know, should have been enough, but it wasn't even close. So I suspect that this being a farm yarn probably got the meters slightly off maybe, because the yarn does look way too thick to have those meters, and I did run out of yarns. So that seems like the most likely explanation, because I don't think this pattern had... Uh, a meter slash yardage that seems off for this sort of garment, right? Like, point is, I ran out of yarn and it was quite hard to get this yarn in the first place. Namely because this yarn I got in a yarn club by a homespun house. And so I got one skein and I love the color. So I immediately tried to look for people who had their skein, got, got it in the club, but didn't like the colorway and would be willing to sell it to me. And I found two people who would right away, so lucky me. And then years later, two years later I think, I started knitting this and then it became a bit of a, a UFO and then I picked it up much later, not that long ago really, maybe it was earlier this year or last year, and realised I had run out of yarn, sort of shortly after the underarm and I should not have run out that quickly and I had to go and find someone who would part with their skein years after this club had happened. I mean, what are the chances that there would be anyone out there? But there was, and they wanted to sell it to me, and I got it relatively quickly, and then it languished again, until now, that I finally have done the body, and it's done. And I'm really glad I had enough yarn, because there's so many cool details at the hem here, with this beautiful split hem. Again, ignore the ends, I will weave them. I will. The split hem here, the way it overlaps, I just love this. I've done this before as well, as you know. It's also that edging off of the rib. Again, subtle detail, but it's just... And there's a lateral braid that runs all the way around the body. Given I only had one skin left, I was knitting from like the outside and the inside at once, and if you know anything about lateral braids, the way that you just make a twist between the two strands for every stitch. Oh god, the tangling, the tangling. And I believe this jumper is one that you can wear both inside out and outside in. <laughs> so you can have the... The reverse docking it, the reverse docking it facing like this, but without the lateral braids. Or you could have the docking it facing, and it just has like a bit of a dent where there's that 
knit stitch pattern running through or purl stitch on this side. Surprisingly with this yarn that I thought was quite soft it actually feels a little bit more prickly now that it's knitted up. That's quite unusual. It's usually the other way around so I'm like okay. Okay. But I also find that the colder I am the more I need the jumper and the less likely I am to itch when I am colder. So it's not going to be an issue. But yeah just look at this shaping. This sort of slight boaty neckline. I am feeling a little bit too toasty to put on a proper pullover just now but just trust that it is lovely. There will be photos on Instagram when the time comes. It almost looks like it's got a gradient but I think that's just the light in this room to be honest. I was very very good at uh, alternating skeins and all that stuff and that paid off a great deal. If anyone wonders how I block jumpers, I think there's a lot of I don't know opinions about blocking this and that. Um, sometimes jumpers don't need to be blocked at personally I think that like I look at Widow's Kiss and the cables are just so popping already it will be blocked next time I wash it you know whereas this definitely benefited from blocking evening out the rib and all that stuff but the way that I do it is I just lay them flat to dry so what I've done with all of these is I leave them in a sort of tub of water at least half an hour I tend to forget them so they're usually in there for a lot longer it's tough to get them to stay down, but the longer you forget them, the more likely they actually get submerged in the water because wool repels fluids before it sucks them in, right? So it just takes a while for it to proper sink in and get water in all the fibers. Then I just gently take it out and let it hang over something to really drip out. So I really get to stretch out some of the bits that I'm unsure about, like neckline, shoulders, things like that. And I do not leave it there for very long because what you don't want is for any of the stuff that you're leaning the garment on to leave a mark, a line or anything like that as it's drying. You don't want anything to stretch out in a way that is kind of going to ruin your jumper to be honest. So that's just a very preliminary thing that I do just to make sure that as the water is still in the jumper I can just smooth out some things if need be. And then as I feel like it's getting dry enough I will lay it flat and shape it the way that I want it. Um, if it's nice and lovely outside I might do that but sometimes I just leave it on the on the rug here. I used to and I still do if it's not summer to squeeze out the water with a towel so roll it in and sit on it and stuff like that. Um, I just don't find I need that when it's super hot outside and it doesn't take that long to dry to be honest. If it's a super wash garment I tend to also make use of the spinner in the washing machine because <sighs> super wash has a way of losing all shape while it's wet and it does fix itself when it's dry again, it's just you don't want to end up with a very awkward shape as it's drying. So that's just a few things that I do these days. But yeah, I'll do it. I'm just going to have to lean back so that you can see it more fully. That'll do, I think. So there it is, my first Isabel Kramer garment, which is about time because she's like probably the most popular designer out there right now, so yay! See, so yeah, I think the yarn is a German merino, just a farm yarn, I don't know who actually made it, it was just kind of a rustic yarn, hand dyed collection in 2017 I think. I am really just rushing through this stuff today because there's also the haul from the yarn show to go through, um, but this one I finished last night and uh, well I'm really really excited about it. This was something I never actually <laughs> thought in a way that I would finish because I knew it was going to be a very slow knit. I just wanted to have some slow forever stocking net laying around that you know it doesn't matter if I finish it. Just something sometimes you need light easy stocking net to bring with you whenever if you just like to knit when you are doing anything. So obviously I thought I was going to finish it. Don't, don't take me too literally. Just with no pressure shall we say. It's a very thin yarn, small needles, full garment kind of thing and I'm like you know what it will just take the time that it takes and as long as I have stock in a project at hand that doesn't take up too much bulk in my bag that's great. And it has been that like I got the the body with me when I went on the train recently and then I was cranking through the sleeves at a party here and there and party I don't party you know what I mean it was a birthday. So suddenly I found myself ready for the yoke and that's when we talked last time and the yoke did take its sweet time, I will say that. But I finished it. When I finally got to the first decrease round, which is quite far up, there's a lot of rounds where you just have a full stitch count, my goodness. But once I got there, it did actually zoom zoom through and I got it in the end. So this is Balmaha by Kate Davies. I started back in 2019 and I have finally finished. And look at that blue. Again, I have deceived myself into thinking that I'm some kind of person who wears color which I, I have also tried to deceive you guys because I'm both, I'm wearing, it's, it's, it's all a lie, <laughs> I wear black. 
But you know, we gotta have something to remind people that actually do have blue eyes. The only modification I have put in here is short rows. I don't know why Kate Davis doesn't put short rows in most of her yolks. I don't know if she put them in any yet. Don't quote me on that. Uh, but I do think that's essential in yolks because otherwise it ends up sitting a little bit too high here and you feel like you're choking a little bit low here and you feel a little bit cold. Maybe that wouldn't have been the case with this corrugated rib, but I felt like it needed it. I was a bit worried that I added too much and it was going to look a little bit balloony in the neck, but it doesn't. This is how it looks here. The way that I like to do these short rows is that I think about how usually each front is about 30% of the stitch count and each sleeve is about 20%. So while I'm up here, I put in markers for what is 20% of the stitch count on each side. So I had a marker here and here and here. So is that four markers, I guess? <laughs> And I made sure I did all my turns within those 20% of my stitches. I think there was like 33 stitches, not 49 on each side here, something like that. So I only made my turns within that and only worked them for the back. So there was no turns, there's no short rows for the front. That's kind of the point, right? So that, that's it's lower. And that worked out pretty well. I don't know how many times I did that. Maybe it was like every sixth stitch, which I think is about five times. Maybe I added 10 rows or something like that to the back. back. It's, about that, I don't know. So this is the Boohoo style yoke. That means it has uh, a yoke that has lots of colors and pearl stitches. Now these were typically, I think, made with uh, kind of Angora yarn, like this rabbit fluff yarn. Uh, There's a particular company in Sweden that used to do this and came up with this style of yokes. And uh, this is my first. So that's really cool. I'm just, this is just so lovely. The play with color here, just because it has these four contrast colors. There's a, a light brown, a dark brown, a blue, and this very, very, very light beige, almost white. And it's nice. And it's lovely. And it's so light as well. I doubt this thing weighs a whole lot. It's just, you know, very fine fingering. This is the Milaroki Tweed by Kate Davis. Worked, I think the body I did on 3.25 millimeter needles. It's a 28 stitch gauge. That's the needle size that I need because I get quite tight. So I need larger needles than like the average person. I reckon you probably use like a three or something. So it's a slow, slow burn. I mean, some people can never reach that gauge because they knit loose, right? So you can tell I prepared a talk about gauge, can't you? Oh, it's so lovely. This is so lovely. And it's soft too. There's a, the yarn is a blend of wool and mohair. I would never have guessed that there was mohair in this yarn, um, but there is, apparently. It should be nice and warm. Added to the winter collection this year. Oh, just, yep. Yeah. And I'm just gonna feel so elegant. It's just lovely. I wanna spend a lot of time on all these things, but I haven't even covered my works in progress yet. I am trying to stay true to form now and continue with my works in progress, my old UFOs. I kind of refuse to call them UFOs, but I mean, they have been languishing for quite some time. I remember buying this yarn back in, it must have been 2017. It's like right after I started this podcast. No, that was 2016. Ooh. <laughs> Yeah, okay, Wait, no, autumn 2016, around this time 2016 it must have been. I got this beautiful sweater quantity from Travel Knitter, a dyer very local to me here in London. Uh, Blueface Leicester Nylon blend would be great for socks, but I got four skeins because of the colorway. And it's that mustache for a while until I knew that I had to make the Alicia Beth cardigan by Justina Lorkowska. And then I did, I did a lot of the yoke as a contiguous, of course I just cranked through that and then I put it aside. And then I picked it up again and, you know, I am insisting on working this flat, same as I did with jadeite. I just had in my mind that I'm some kind of person who can do things flat and not put a steak in and do in the round, but none of these yarns are really suitable for that without sewing machine seams, so I'm just gonna, I am gonna do this flat. It's gonna be purling. There's a lot of texture in this and I've decided to maintain the texture all the way down to the hem instead of like gradually transitioning into more stock in that. I just like doing this. So this is kind of where it's at. I, sorry, it looks really weird there. I'm, I still have yarn on those needles for the body, but I really wanted to get to the sleeves so that they are the way. And I know that the yarn I have left is gonna be for the body, just in case I run out. Not that I think there's any reason to worry about that. It's just good to know. This is the back, look at this. There's like a fake cable pattern. that runs all the way down because I wanted it to. It's usually just the middle one that should run all the way down, but I wanted all of it to, so that's what it will. This yarn, this color, it is so gorgeous. It's kind of blowing up, but it's, yeah, it's called Brambleberry, and that's pretty accurate for what it is. It's quite thin as well. The yarn is probably 
bit thinner for the gauge than anything. And I also think I'm not getting gauge. I should have gone down a needle size from what I'm doing. And so it will be looser, which is good because my size is bigger now than it was back then. So everyone's winning here. Uh, so the sleeve is happening, but it is working very slowly and I am decreasing a little bit at my own rate because I don't want it to be as snug as the pattern says. I think if I was going with that snugness, I would have probably been bang on when it comes to the size, but I don't like things that too tightly, to be honest. Unfortunately, no matter how much I alternate skein, you can see there's a bit of a transition here between the sleeve and the body, just about. Not super obvious, actually. It might be more obvious in my head than in reality, so I think, I think we're good there. So I've just been cranking on with the sleeve and the other sleeve, so I have that, and then I can focus on the body, and then... All I got left then is the bottom band and sewing on buttons and weaving ends and, and all those things. You know, it really is just around the corner. I lie, it's not. This is a very slow knit. You may find, you know, this. it's quite likely that I will put this aside again and we will see it in another year. It's nice to have one of those slow going projects as well. And you know, sometimes they may surprise you and become like Balmaha, that wasn't a slow project at all in the end. You never know. But it's nice to just have this here next to the sofa that I can just pick up. It's honestly pretty easy to get back into again, so I don't mind having it sort of here and just a bit on and off. But right now it is in rotation and that is a lot of fun. And I wanted to share where that progress is at right now. Finally, finally, I am working on my Kala shawl again. I am so enthusiastic about this shawl. Whenever someone asks me which of my projects I am most excited to have finished, I actually say the Kala shawl, even though I haven't worked on it for years. Again, because it is quite involved between the broken rib pattern, there is a lot of both sides cabling going on. Um, so you work both sides of the shawls and it's a cable lace pattern. Uh, it just requires a lot of focus and isn't something I'm always in the mindset for, but I am right now and I actually made a lot of progress just this morning alone. So this is the Kala shawl made in this wonderful John Arban yarn that died by Viola. So this is sort of the equivalent of the knit by numbers DK Falkland Merino. It is so squishy and lovely and soft and this burgundy is obviously right up my alley. You couldn't have got it more right. Um, it's a little bit varied in tone as well and then you got this beautiful cable lace chart that's happening here where it sort of has these bubbles with eyelets and I, I don't know what to say this was in lane magazine a while back and it's probably my favorite issue off lane i want to make everything in that one and i think i've made quite a few things already i believe that was the same one that had the boohoos and a few other things it's just it's a lovely magazine i you know it's rarely that knitting magazines speak to me that much because I mean I have a lot of them and they can't all be a hit with me personally but that issue yes just yes and I oh I'm so excited about having this it is possible that this shawl will be a smidge smaller than it says in the pattern but it's also quite big in the pattern so but it's lovely I love the density of this it's just it's gonna be again so lovely and warm and soft it's this <laughs> It's perfect. I, I, It's gonna be the most beautiful shawl I've ever made. And I'm enjoying it right now as well. And and that that's my works in progress. Finally, we can talk about my acquisitions. I have them in a big bag right here and there's also some right next to me on here because I shopped. I shopped a great deal. I didn't actually know about this yarn show at all. I don't know what's going on with any yarn shows these days. Um, but a friend of mine asked me if I wanted to tag along and I did and it wasn't really that far even just kind of beyond Reading in Newbury. Well I didn't have any yarn in mind I had been very good in a yarn call with a friend the day before I didn't buy anything so I was like I'm probably gonna buy something and the first thing I bought is this year's West Yorkshire Spinner Four Plies Christmas Colorway Gingerbread 1109. I think they've done gingerbread before but this is just a different gingerbread color. So this is self-striping yarn so it alternates between this sort of gingerbread orange brown and these white red sequences and green white sequences and I've seen the samples they look pretty cool so I'll be enjoying that whether it's this Christmas or another Christmas or any other time of year because I have a lot of their Christmas colorways already I do tend to buy them pretty much every time because when you start collecting you know how it is now the project I actually traveled with there was the Balmaha pullover and so imagine my surprise when I see heavily discounted Kate Davies Milarkey tweed yarn. Yeah. So normally I would say, you know, 
play people in full and all that stuff. But I trust me, I've put a fair amount of <laughs> of my money in Kate Davies where I'm just looking at all my Kate Davies collections over there. There's a lot of magazines of hers. I just love her stuff. And um, in this particular booth, with I wonder if this was Uppingham Yarns, where there's a lot of discounted yarns and bargains and bulk buying and stuff like that. And if you bought this Kate Davies yarn in bulk, you save more than half. And so I naturally bought two uh, kind of bulks, if you will. So they were sold in these half kilo units like this. So yeah, I had to get two. My goodness, did I have to get two. And it's lovely, can highly recommend. Obviously I bought two kits of of this yarn from Kate Davies. One of them was the Balmaha pullover and the other one is the Sleeve Island that I am still working on, at least in theory. <laughs> so now I have more of that because it is really lovely. I'm enjoying knitting on it a great deal. It is quite fine, so if I'm holding it single, I'm going to have to accept quite a tight gauge, i.e. small needles, i.e. a slower project, but okay. Maybe I'll design something with this. Maybe I'll make something that's kind of like a massive, boxy, slow, but you know, rewarding knit and you know having said that there was quite a bit of leftover yarn from Balmaha I didn't modify at all and I had two skeins that I'd never even used so there are some options there for contrast colors even and I might have a think about that or I'll just find an existing pattern on it that we'll see you know it feels really good to know that I've actually emptied my stash quite a bit both in finishing things de-stashing and organizing in general I I think throughout lockdown I reduced my stash by a third and not just through knitting that would be a lot but yeah in, in general I think I've shaped it up a bit and so yeah I bought another two sweater quantities just casually placing them here I came across this new to me dyer called Dina's Home of Crafts who had this beautiful yarn I mean I don't know if you can see this but it is burgundy it's very burgundy it's a dark burgundy and I more or less tore five skeins off the shelves and slapped it on the table. I wanted all of them. And then it was apparently like different colorways and dyed on different undertones and stuff. And I was like, okay, please help me find the right ones. And yeah, it's, it's, it's really nice. So they're DK weights and I got a contrast color as well because you never know when I'm gonna feel like doing color work. And if not, I guess it's a hat, whatever. So that's what I got there. And yeah, really lovely. Yeah, I just love this color. This, I have, there's a lot of burgundies that are close to my heart, but the darker it gets, usually the happier I get. So let's, let's give it a bit of a close up. My camera will probably blow out, but it's getting a little bit dusky around here anyway. So I imagine that's why we're not seeing it in its full bloom. Yeah. It is coming across a little bit purpley. I don't think it's very purpley in real life. It is a bit, but it has enough red to it that I would say this is a, a pretty true burgundy. So that's that. So um, logo close up, of course. Of course. So there is Dina's house of crafts. Dina's home of crafts, my goodness. And after I had been walking around in circles, I'd been thinking about this yarn that I had seen in the corner of my eye. And I was like, I'm not gonna buy that. I used to have that and I knitted it up. I'm not gonna buy it again. But then I was like, you know what? Isn't that what we do though? We buy lots of yarn and then we struggle to knit it all up. And when we do, it's like, well, I gotta buy it back into my stash again. I can't have my stash having run out of that yarn. Oh, the justifications. <laughs> so I saw Skein Queen Sonsi yarn, and some of you might remember, if you have good memory, I almost don't, uh, that I had Skein Queen Sonsi in DK, that I made the, I think it was pronounced Apricite pullover. I wonder if it was from the same magazine of Lane that had Kala, actually. I just loved everything in that one. And I held it together with silk mohair from Ainsworth, uh, knit the Knitting Shed, who was also there and has amazing colors. But this is iron weight, so it's totally different. And it is a different colorway as well, because it's burgundy. And I thought with three skeins of iron, that should be enough for a garment, because these are 200 grams each. I think that's plenty to do most things, I reckon. That is in garment land, I mean. So this, this is that. Uh, let's do a little close-up. This is the mahogany colorway, seems very appropriate. And yeah, Sonsi Aran, 70% Corydale, 30% Polworth, Aran, 200 grams, 352 meters. And that's GameQueenTheArts.co.uk. Now, some of you may be ballsy enough to say that that is a very similar colorway to the other sweater quantity that you bought. Did you really just buy two almost identical 
colorways. I'm like, no, they are totally different. Like, well, this one is 70% Corydale and this one is 100% Corydale. So, and it's DK and Iron, they're, they're totally different. It's, it is it is darker in, in this light, <laughs> lucky for me. In this light is looking a lot darker. Oh, thank you. It's because I'm doing, nah, okay. Shush. I'm gonna look lovely, that's all I'm saying. So there, my two sweater quantities. Finally, I wanna give a small little shout out to John Arben Yarn, who sent me this little mini skin that I get to use to explore their new Yarnadelic yarn. It's gonna come in a new weight. Uh, more on that later, if you know, I maybe decide to design with it. I know I'm doing this. I didn't actually request any of the particular colorways. I even asked him if I could get a shade card so I could look at the different colorways in case I want to design with it. Uh, but apparently they read my mind and figured out exactly what my favorite colorway of, of this shade card would be. And it's the Indigo Dust colorway and it is lovely. This is a sort of dual tone that's just right up my alley. And it is really, really lovely. It's definitely something that you could use in place for a phenol. I can't speak to the stickability of this yarn. This is Falklands Corydale, so I imagine it's less rustic and all that stuff. But if you wanted to do any of the mittens for my club, for instance, I just thinking off the top of my head now, I don't see why not. That this seems very lovely, very similar weight to phenol and, and stuff like that. Just like softer, yeah. I just thought I put that out there. I did it. I got to all of it. Okay, also, a uh, general impression of the Southwestern Wool Show is that it was fun. It wasn't too big, which is always lovely. I think it was a bit of a maybe mistake for the past couple of years before lockdown that every yarn show in the UK seemed to want to try to be bigger and better than the last one when there is such a thing as a too big yarn show. I hate to say it because I'm going to go to Yarndell, which is massive and I love it. And I used to love it in Yarn Show when that happened. You know, I love a big yarn show, but this was just two buildings, so that sounds like a lot actually, but it, two rooms, right? And that was manageable and really nice, so lots of different things. And it's nice when there's lots of different things because it doesn't, it means that I actually can narrow it down to actually what I want to buy as well. I don't feel like I have to get everything and then maybe end up with nothing. It also does mean, most importantly, that it's catering to a lot of different tastes and income levels and crafts and well, just categories of things to buy. It doesn't all have to be yarn when you go to a yarn show. It can be needles, it can be bags, accessories, tools, even stuff that people are made with it and patterns and showing off samples. There's a lot of different things like that and I really appreciated it and I appreciate the vicinity to London. <laughs> so all of that was really good. I had a lovely time. So yeah, next place I might see you guys is at Stitchurama in Harmad next weekend or might see you in Yarndale. I think I'll be there the entire time, so that should be good. Uh, more on that later, I think. There's still time there. So yeah. In personal news, I don't think I have much to cover, really. Life is just going on here. But yeah, more news about all sorts on my newsletter, so do sign up for that. I can highly recommend it to keep on top of things, especially now days that no matter who you subscribe to, it doesn't mean that Instagram or YouTube wants to actually let you see it, which is very frustrating. I, I know I find it frustrating because I want to see who I follow and I just don't. So then I'll rather just subscribe to the newsletter so that I know that I don't miss out on anything. and. I also, as someone who sends out newsletters, try to make sure that I only send the important stuff and, you know, nice, nice things. And so be in touch there. It's been a while, so I'll send one out hopefully not too long. And yeah, I guess subscribe to this channel. I don't think I have to say that. I should say that more, shouldn't I? If you want to keep up with these videos, that would be absolutely lovely. And then I will see you next time. Thanks so much for watching. Bye.